mighty powerful this morning. You know, I've made a number of Floridian slips as it related to the shift conference. <laughs> Many times I refer to it as spirit and truth. mighty apostle. Apostle Davis is in that in-between period, that neutralized session where he's moving us, preparing us, using that sandpaper to scratch and get us into that place that God has ordained for us to be. And sometimes it just didn't feel good. But now, everything feels like it's moving into the proper place, proper alignment. The, the shift is really, really, really being felt and experienced. So we thank God for the wisdom. We thank God for the knowledge. We thank God for the courage and for the tenacity and for the integrity of our great spiritual father and leader in Apostle Stephen A. Davis. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Oh, bless God. Bless God. And while you're on your feet, God didn't make him to be by himself. He gave him a powerful prayer warrior, an intercessor with a discerning spirit, a sweet, yet a powerful woman of God, and our first lady, Lady Darlene Davis. Thank you. Thank you. My African family would say, now clap for yourself. Yeah. Daddy Long would say many times, nobody would be interested in hearing me if it had not been for you all. So clap for yourself. I bless God for each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your fellowship and your leadership. Uh, the centurion said, uh-uh, I understand that there are times when I'm in charge, I'm the leader. But then there are other times when I'm under authority and, and we don't know the difference between the two, we gonna get ourselves in a mess of trouble. But I bless God that you understand and you have learned how to submit, yet you have learned how to rule. You take dominion and yet you submit under the authority of this great house and you ought to be applauded for your greatness. Thank you, Jesus. The Holy Spirit is doing something wonderful in this place. And I am mighty glad to be here. Amen. All right. Well, as you take your seats, Father, I ask, ask you now to allow what you've placed in me over these past 19 years to bless, to encourage, to stir, to change, to shift us into a greater understanding of the global apostolic mission that you placed on all of our lives. Because of you, greatness ah, stands at the door. Have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, time's a little off, so can you help me? <laughs> okay. Bless God. <laughs> Amen. So, when I first knew that God was beginning to work something different in me, I was extremely happy where I was serving. Hmm? I mean, Daddy Long was a phenomenal spiritual father, and I was just excited to serve him. And then God began to work a thing in me. The time I was the chief leadership officer at New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. And I began to talk to Daddy Long, and he said, okay, thank you. Now go back over there and go to work. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. And then as he's ministering, I'm not able to stand on my feet because the word is doing one thing and God is saying some impartations that is taking what he's saying into a, a different realm. And I didn't say a word because I gave, was given instructions to go back to work. So I went back to work. That was my assignment. And one day sitting behind him on the pulpit, I don't think I was sitting. I think I was doing the floor ministry. You understand all about that one. All was all over the floor. And I, I don't know if Kennedy or Powell, somebody was trying to help. It wasn't doing any good because I was toe up from the floor. Toe up. <laughs> yeah, on the floor. And so he said, uh, you know, for the longest time, Daddy Long didn't know my name. Oh, I didn't think he did. It was our joke. It was girl. He said, go get that girl and tell her to come to my office. <laughs> so, so I went to his office and uh, he says, all right, what's going on? I said, sir, God is showing me that there is a huge territory that he has given unto us. And he wants us to take it. And he says, we can't take it by sitting in one place. We've got to be on the move in order to take everything that he has ordained for us. And I said, I, I know that it is a corporate thing. It's not about me, but, but he's using me. He wants me to be one of those that, that move and make a way for others. But he says, okay, I want you to write it out. He said, it sounds very clearly like a vision. And if God has given you a vision, he's going to help you to make it plain. Write it. Make an appointment and come back. And let's talk again. By this time, I had completed at least four or five short-term missions trips in West Africa. So I knew West Africa was the place that God was calling me for service. As a matter of fact, the first time I landed in Ghana, we touched down in Ghana before going to Liberia. We got off the plane in Ghana and we're walking down the 
airport to the, the terminal to get to the airport and lined up from the airport to the terminal were soldiers with AK-47s on both sides and we're walking right through the center of them. I told God then he made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. I, I realize you're the almighty God, but th you got this one wrong. <laughs> Nevertheless, and everybody else wanted to go out and go around. I said, uh-uh, this is a, a transition, just a layover before we get to our appointed place. And, and I've already got shooken up just coming off the plane. I'm going to just siesta right here until it's time for us to take that next flight. But then the next flight and the chaos that we experience at the terminal. You know, and the enemy does things on purpose in order to get you distracted so that you won't complete the assignment that God has for you. Many of you have had a unction in your spirit that God was saying, do this, do that. And the moment you started to do it, all of the distractions got in your way. You said, this can't be God. And you turned around to do something easier, something more comfortable, something that was in your plan, not necessarily in the one God had for you. Well, we got through the chaos, got through the terminal, riding in the van from the airport to the campus where we were staying. I cannot tell you what it was except for God was causing everything in me to react to the location and the surroundings, not with fear, but with a, a connection. I don't know if it makes any sense to you, but tears ran down my face as I'm looking at all of the telephone poles and all of the wires had been cut. As I'm seeing cars which were bombed out and, and burnt up on the side of the road and as I'm Driving on the way to the campus, it's like we took a time warp back. People living in shanty houses and straw huts and my God. The war was going on then. Taylor was in office. He's a tyrant. He's currently serving time in jail. Not for the atrocities that he did for his own country, but for the atrocities that he did for the neighboring countries over what they call blood diamonds. The country was suffering. And God was sending me on a mission to impact cities and influence nations. Missions is not about what we have become to make it. And missions was not about just one or two individuals going uh, to do something in a third world area. Missions is for all of us. Each and every one that is called as a child of God is also called to serve somewhere in God's army. I'm going to finish that story for you, but let me do this. In the book of Joshua, Thank you. Joshua 1, 12. The scriptures that I shared with my spiritual father as to what God was saying. And the Reubenites 
and the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God has given you rest and has given you this land. But your wives and your little ones, your cattle shall remain in this land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, almighty men of valor, and help them until the Lord have given your brothers rest as he has given you. And they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land, your land and possess it and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan towards the sun rising. God was saying, you can't have rest until you help your brothers who needed rest. Tossing and turning and tossing and turning, trying to get an understanding. How do I help my brothers get rest so that I can come home and rest? <laughs> process continues. So I was released to go into full-time missions in uh, 2007. Daddy Long says, I'm going to give you one year and then I want you to come back here and work. And go back to serving. I say, yes, sir. I took that one year. In that one year's time, we were able to touch the lives of many cities and influence a nation. But it wasn't all easy. There were many times the challenges, cultural challenges, weather challenges, um, insect challenges. Uh -huh. I don't like spiders. Like, I don't have a problem with geckos. I don't have a problem with um, scorpions. I don't have a problem with Flies, but spiders, that's not my thing. So Dr. West went with me in 2007. She didn't like the geckos. It was a good match. I got rid of the spiders for her. I mean, I got rid of the geckos for her. She got rid of the spiders for me. But God sent us there to influence cities and impact nations. And he's still calling us as a people to do the very same thing. His word hasn't changed. And so all of us have got to get into a place that we won't want to venture out to do things as individual nations, individual kingdoms. As, as Daddy Long would say, everybody in their own kingdom doing their own thing, it will take you longer to complete an assignment. But if we all get together under one headship and we begin to pull our resources and pull our people together, we can complete assignments way ahead of time. If we have something that's great that's going on, I believe Apostle Crosby has already started, we begin to share what's going on so that we can help one another to move together because we're more powerful together than we are individual. The emphasis for the apostles that were setting up missionary journeys all had to do with being centered around the, the, the focus of changing the lives of the people that they came in contact with. 
So every missions trip, every missionary journey has to do with changing the lives of the people that we come in contact with. We went to Jamaica. Uh -huh. I like to go to very nice places for a missions trip because I know some of y'all ain't going to the places I go to. So Daddy Long always wanted to go to Hawaii. I have yet to do a mission trip in Hawaii, but we're going to do that one one day. Amen? And we're going to name it after our daddy. So we went to Jamaica. Now this particular place, it wasn't on the seacoast because you know, a lot of countries, if you go into the tourist area, it is very nicely laid out. Mm -hmm. You don't see the third world environment until you get off the tourist area. So we went way up to the highest peak in Jamaica, <laughs> reserve community. And it is, it is on a, the top of the mountain. It's a plateau on the top of the mountain. You can look out across the water. You can see Cuba. <laughs> and the people there needed Christ. There was a, a, a church that a family, one sister built a church on one side of the street and the brother built a guest house on the other side of the street. Nice arrangement, huh? There was a fight between the two and the brother vowed never to step foot in the church. And so we went, we stayed in the guest house. We didn't know about the fight. We were on a journey and that particular vacation Bible school was journey off the map. So we're on this journey truly off the map because when you finish going through this winding street to get to the top of this mountain to have this vacation Bible school, the, the, they dropped us off in a uh, bus, but then the only way to get to the community to go shopping was in a community van. They call it their local bus. But to get up the hill, the man had to go up the hill backwards. That wasn't no fun. That wasn't no fun. And he didn't go up the hill backwards at a normal speed. It's like he floored it. And they're going, I, yeah, okay. I said, God, uh, thank you for this experience, but we don't have to do this one again. But when we got there, the, the young lady that was over the church, uh, she was sent from that parish to, to minister in that church. She, um, she met us and she was a little standoffish because she said she didn't have enough information about who we were. And she didn't realize that we were Baptists. So she said, are all y'all Baptists? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, hmm. She sat back and she observed us the whole time. The children, the children were so restrained. The first day we got there, Vacation Bible School, we're on a journey, oh. We're on a journey, journey off the map. We dancing and we shouting, we trying to get the kids involved. They like, we said, okay. So we went in the streets and brought in <laughs> some non-church kids. <laughs> huh? Okay. The church kids have been trained. They've been trained by some old church folk. And they acting just as old as old church folk. So the new kids, we start the next day, we starting at nine o'clock. They didn't know, the only thing the kids in the community knew, there was a lot of noise, they was having fun, they was dancing, they came home with arts and crafts. So the kids in the community, they showed up in big numbers. Now, we wanna go and we wanna do our dance. Oh, now we got the whole church. We just dancing around the church. We just worshiping God and having ourselves a good time. And the kids were all involved. They were just, oh, miss, miss, can we do this? Miss, miss. Everybody was involved in the ministry. <laughs> 
Susan was there. Gwen was there. Uh, Dorothy was there. Lewis was there. We had about 12 of us. And so we gave gifts also. The lady that was running the church, we gave her a gift. It was a cross. It's a nice necklace and a cross. She gave it back to me. She says, Dr. Riley, we don't wear jewelry. We don't do our hair. We don't do our nails. And ladies don't wear trousers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. We just messed up all of y'all's church theology. And all we did was get off the bus. I said, okay, well, you know, it's all good. Because God is coming back for a church. One church. The church without a spot or a wrinkle. That's, that's what I read. That's, that's, that's what I understand. That's, that's what God's coming back for. And so, you know, the different denominations don't matter. Dr. Riley, I don't believe that either. I said, Dad, I think she just told me I was going to hell. smiled and it was going to be okay. Yeah. The community came out to that church every day. It was more, more people coming from the community every day. And um, so when we left and I thought that was going to be my last time, I'm like, okay, Lord, I, I believe I heard you. I did what you wanted me to do because I know that there was a culture that was being developed there and it was handicapping the people so that they wouldn't understand the grace of God. And there is a multitude of grace that God has released. He's not in that Old Testament, can't wear this, can't do that. He's, he's not there. So just to be, bring that refreshing to that community, I was like satisfied. And then he said, I need you to go back. The ride, I'm praying, I'm praying, you know, like I'm, I gotta take these people back home. You know, I, you, the ride up this winding, turning street, no rails, it was two lane, but it's only one lane. You, you know what I'm saying? And I said, Jesus is Lord. But we went back and this time, this time, God was, had, had already done something because when we walked in the sanctuary this time, instead of everybody sitting there, and the, they were up and they were bouncing and they were dancing. And then they got a little dance in one of the songs and they started walking around the church. I said, look at God. <laughs> so as we were, uh, each night we had prayer before service. Um, vacation Bible school during the day and some type of service in the evening. So we'd have prayer every day. And the evangelist that was over the church, she came to me and the last night we weren't doing anything that Friday night. We were going to pack because it was, we were leave early Saturday morning. She said, but um, can we have another one of them prayer services? I said, hmm. She said, you know, when you guys first came here, my mind was thinking one way, but I haven't experienced nothing but the love of God from you all, from the time you got here until this time for you all to leave. That's our assignment. 
There are many areas, there are many communities, there's many cities that need the influence of the love of God. And we've got to take Christ all over the world. And the way we take Christ is we take him through love. If you can't take him through love, stay home, send somebody else to go, okay? Because everybody is supposed to be involved in missions. But you can help support someone that will go to show the love of God no matter what the situation is. And there have been some really challenging situations. And every time I get, I hear God saying, where's the love? Where's the love? Where's the love? As missionaries, it's our job to train others so that they will train others. So when we went into this community, us being ourselves, Susan just dancing and being, doing the Susan. But then when you come back and you see where, where they were so restricted and, and so confined and now they're loose and they're free and they understand, you can have liberties in Christ Jesus. And Christ has called us into a greater calling. And there are, there are people that you will not be able to reach by beating them over the head with a book, by wearing a doily on your head and continuously in long skirts. They will not listen to you. This community needs to see some red hair. Where my red haired sister at? Yes. Yes. This generation loves that. And if we are going to represent Christ, we've got to get to the place where the people need to see Christ. I know I'm all over the place, but there is a slide that talks about the world's largest number of people that have not heard the gospel. He wants us to get to the places where the gospel has not been preached. Because the answer to the age old question, when will Jesus return? It's in the word. Once the gospel is preached all over the world, then the world is ready for his return. But there is a window, there's a window, there's a 1040 window. And in this window, there are millions to say billions of people that have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we, we who hear the gospel, who sit in these nice plush seats, got beautiful air condition, ah, how lovely homes, beautiful cars. I see in the parking lot, y'all ain't suffering. <laughs> Amen. We, we, have, we, have, we have a group of people that God wants us to minister to. And, and in that, in that, 1040 window, the numbers are staggering. Billions and billions of people that haven't heard the gospel. And on the flip side of that coin, there are 400,000 full-time missionaries. Let's take 200 billion people and divide it by 400,000 missionaries. That's a large number. And in the material that Apostle gave us to read about the apostolic church arising, it says it takes five full-time pastors in order to save one person. And by the end of the year, that person is no longer attending service. We got some work to do. The shift is not so that we can get into a nice plushy place and say we are there. Uh-uh. This shift is so that we understand that the work yet has to be done and God is calling on us in order to do it. He trusts us enough to give us this great responsibility of not saying, we have entered the shift, we have entered the shift. We got praise and worship now. We understand we're gonna take some of the weight off of the, the praise and worship leaders. We, we understand that, that 
apostle needs his arms to be held up and it's not a temporary job, but you gotta be praying and interceding for him on a full time basis. We feel the love and the support that he's getting from all the yellow shirts. Uh huh. All the yellow shirts. I know it's a few people that don't have yellow because they ran out and whatever, but there's some black and some white shirts up in here too. That they have come from different places, different ministries to say that, hey, we won. We might have different locations, but we're going to function together as one unit. That long says if you're in a fight and it's just you in that fight, you might get taken down. <laughs> Did he say it? But if all of us get together in that fight and stand together, nobody can take us down. The same as it relates to missions. When we begin to move and mobilize and understand that we're going to train up people so that they can go into the community. Let's just start with a vacation Bible school. Get the kids. That's the dying generation. This garbage that they're teaching our children as far as health education, I can't put it no other way, but it is garbage. It has tainted their minds at the age of 10, 11, and 12. And if they don't have somebody out there that love them and say, no baby, <laughs> no baby, you are wonderfully and fearfully made. You made after the image of God. He has placed powers in you. There's nothing that you can't do. And you are a lady. You are a lady. Hey, bro. What's up, man? Yeah. You, you are a man of God. God made you. God filled you and strengthened you. He, they got to hear from a man. So we can't be all females going on the mission field. We got to have some lenses <laughs> to go with us because those children need to see they don't have a male figure in their house. So when we are there, we're representing the male figures that they, this summer, this summer, we do one domestic uh, missions trip a year. And this summer we went to Sylvester, Georgia. I know y'all never heard of it, but it's on the map. And in Sylvester, um, one of a community center, we had our vacation Bible school. This year's vacation Bible school was uh, whoosh. And the whoosh had to do with these kids that were taking a trip on spirit-led um, bicycles. So they were going to different locations, but the lesson taught about faith. It taught about integrity. It, it taught them different godly characteristics that they don't get in school anymore. Some of them have never heard of it in their homes. And we were just having a good time, but since the bikes was the theme, we actually purchased some bikes and we had them around the stage as we were doing vacation Bible school. And we, we teach them to get up and it's okay to dance in Jesus. It's okay to have a good time in God. And then at the end of the session, we gave away the bikes. The one young man that won one of the bikes was, he came in devastated. He came in a bruised, he came in beat up. He had no self-esteem, not low, he had none. And when he won that bike, 
the joy and the gleam that went over his face. And what we said is, we just want you to appreciate God. Just appreciate God, because we came as ambassadors for Christ. And so what you have now is the love that God actually has for you. May not have done the whole nation, but we begin to start something. And you begin to affect one child at a time. The love that we experience from those children is amazing. And to catch them at that age. I, and I told God a long time ago, I used to teach teachers training. I would develop teachers that would teach in the elementary age. Uh, the children. But he helped me to know that that's the generation that's being neglected and abused and forgotten and thrown away. And that's the generation that we're going to have to make sure we are intentional about going after. Jesus said in Matthews 28 and 18 through 20, Jesus said unto them, all power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. This power I give to you. Now, and I add emphasis. Now, take it and go. Make followers of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do all things that I have told you. Fear not. For I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So I went back to Daddy Long and I said, we can reach the children in different countries and specifically in Liberia at the time by bringing something to the country that they don't have. 2007, there was no governmental electricity. If you had electricity, you had your own personal generator. Different schools were changing over their computers. They were advancing, getting new ones. So they gave me a whole bunch of what they called their old computers. We loaded them in a container and we had shipped them off to Liberia. We reached the children through computer classes. The center that was in Liberia was New Birth Empowerment Center. That empowerment center was on two different campuses in Monrovia. And we also helped to empower five different schools because we had so many computers and we didn't want them to just sit and rot. So we went to different schools. This one was, gave 10, this one had 12, this one had 15. We taught the teachers how to teach computers and we left them with the manuals so that they can continue to train and raise up children that would be computer literate. As they were practicing their typing, They started off with the 23rd Psalm. Then they began to type Psalms 91. You can take that, let's go over to Psalms 119. So you're, you're typing, but what you're doing is you're meditating on the word. Muslims wanted to come to the school you're welcome. This is, well, can we come after prayer? Nope. <laughs> it would be considered late if you come in after prayer. So you are more than welcome to sign up for the school, but let me explain to you the rules. 
If you are more than two days late, you're gonna have to repeat the class. So welcome to come, Muslims. But we're gonna open this class up with prayer in Jesus' name. So our staff was growing and excited and happy to be a part of something that's new. Those teachers that was a staff then are now in different industries, but they come back to us every time we come back and they tell us about the character traits that they are now teaching in their new jobs that they learned when they were at the New Birth Empowerment Center. Seeds that you sow today, you have no idea how they're going to grow. Ah, and the fullness thereof. So when Ebola came in 2014, let me see if I go to 2013. 2013, God gave me the urge, which I've never had before, to do a medical missions. I'm a teacher. We usually do workshops, seminars, training classes. That's, that's what we do. But nevertheless, this time God says do a medical mission. We said, okay. We got in touch with one of the local clinics and said, we would like to come partner with you and do a medical missions. We would like to do it these two or three days. This is what the schedule would look like. A friend had a warehouse of medical supplies. She was shutting down the warehouse. <laughs> she was shutting down the warehouse. And she says, by this date, if the material is not out of the warehouse, she was going to throw it in the trash. I said, the devil is a lie. We took those big barrels and we loaded up as many barrels as we could. And just like the fishermen, when they had their nets were so full that they couldn't carry it all, I called two other church friends who were missionaries in different churches. And I said, we got some medical supplies over here. They came with trucks and made sure none of those supplies was thrown in the trash, but every one of those supplies was used for somebody in some place as a service. So in October of 2013, we did this medical missions in conjunction with this local clinic. And the barrels of medical supplies did not reach during the time we're doing our medical missions. Couldn't stop us because now the word was out and the people were coming. Trust me, we said nine o'clock. They started lining up at six o'clock in the morning. We had people just camped out waiting for us. So we purchased supplies. We took as many as we could with us in our own bags. And when we got there, we talked with the guy in the clinic and says, okay, what do we need to do in order to make this successful? Because our barrels are not here. We treated, I don't even know how many, hundreds of people during those two or three days. Everybody went home with something. Whereas you might have gone home with a whole bottle full of something, now you may only go home with 12 different tablets, but everybody went home with something. Some of the people, we had a tent outside and we had prayer and praise and worship. We laid hands, we prayed for them. Some of them got healed, didn't even have to go into the clinic. Amen. God be the glory. In 2014, Ebola comes into the country and with Ebola, all school systems, all educational systems had to shut down. At first they were in denial in reference to Ebola, but then they realized you can't deny it because people continuously dying. And it was transmitted just by the touching of skin. So they didn't want schools open, they didn't want churches open, nothing where people would touch people because if you had it and you touched someone, it would spread just like that. 
So our staff was now in a place of being hmm, not really unemployed, but I guess unemployed because you were employed because of the students and the school was self-sustaining. So there was no salary going in, but we were able to make sure that by fundraising efforts on this side, they received something every month to make sure they had food and the necessary supplies that they needed. But what Ebola did was it caused an enormous amount of orphans for the country. Now the war, which was a 14 year civil war, had already created a huge number of orphans. And now Ebola comes and adds even more orphans to an already terrible situation. But God has a plan. In 2014, after no, 2015, after the Ebola se season was going and going, the barrels did arrive, but they arrived after the team was gone. I was still there, but the team was gone. So when the farmers, the um, young man over the clinic got all of the supplies, he was so happy because everything was in that barrel. I'm telling you, absolutely everything was in that barrel to keep him and his staff alive during that Ebola season. Some of the stuff we had no idea of what it, it was like, what is this? I don't know, we put it in the barrel. Gwen was like, what is this? I don't know, we put it in the barrel. So he sent us a letter and he said, Dr. Riley, thank you for the, the supplies and everything that you people sent us uh, in those barrels. We appreciate it more than you know. He said, it was as if you people knew what was going to happen. We people had not a clue. But God, God who knows all things, <laughs> he had already had everything worked out. And he said, my staff was able to treat people and, and not get infected because of everything that was in those barrels. So sometimes when it's not what you normally do, I wouldn't normally do a medical missions, but when God had such an unction on you to do something, he's placing it there for a reason. It's not about you. That's the one thing we have to understand. It's not about us. Ministry is not about us, but it's about who God wants us to touch, the lives he wants us to change, the people that need to be transformed, those that not only need to hear the gospel, but they need to see the gospel in us. Well, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, Apostle, I came to uh, Apostle Davis and I said, you know what? Um, the campus in Liberia is there and we are ready to build. And I said, we purchased the land in 2010. And I just know that God is saying, it's time to do something. So we begin to talk and dialogue and he says, you know, I wanted, always wanted an orphanage. Hmm. I said, oh, not a problem. The three acres of land, if we have the um, picture of the property that's in Liberia, the three acres of land and one of the young men in Liberia actually drew this model up for me. Now this one, no, go back to that one, that's fine. This one is the foundation for the orphanage. The orphanage will house 32 children. Amen? This is Apostle Stephen A. Davis Orphanage in Liberia, West Africa. Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. <laughs> then the other picture, let's go back to the actual layout now. So the, the young man actually drew the layout for me. Um, the brown roof is at front. That is our chapel. The chapel is um, a 250-seat chapel. It has two offices and um, restrooms. Um, the white roof right behind the chapel, that's our orphanage. Uh, that's one you've already seen where the foundation is um, already finished. We will be pouring the slab for the foundation in October. Amen. <laughs> Gotta give you a dream. Don't let it go. Hold on to it. It might not be for today, but hold on to it. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. It has an appointed time. It has an appointed season. And when it is its time, it shall not tarry. Let me tell you this. It is the time, it is the season for it now. If we go back to our, um, yeah. The other white building right in front of me anyway is the bed and breakfast. So once the bed and breakfast is finished, you will have no excuse for not coming and serving in Liberia, West Africa. I'm taking away all the excuses. Uh-huh. You got a chapel, I know you like to teach and preach. We gonna have children that need to be raised up. We got a bed and breakfast right there and the next kind of a brownish roof, that is our vocational training center. Amen.